I'm a bit of the warm-up act. My name is Joy Johnson, and I'm the scientific director for the Institute of Gender and Health at CIHR. Um, they are going to be um, delivering dessert, and while they do that, I'm going to take just a few minutes to briefly um, say a few words about CIHR, uh, and then I'm going to introduce our afternoon speaker. On behalf of the president of CIHR, Dr. Alain Baudet, I'm very, very pleased to uh, welcome you to the Gender Summit. CIHR is very, very pleased to be a partner in the Gender Summit. The Institute of Gender and Health is one of 13 institutes that make up CIHR. And our mandate is to foster and uh, fund research that uh, improves the health of men, women, boys, and girls. And I do like to remind people that men have a gender too, and so that indeed uh, uh, we believe that um, we need to uh, shine a focus on both men and women in terms of their health outcome. One of the accomplishments that we're particularly proud of is uh, the integration of sex and gender considerations in all of our funding opportunities. So now, when you apply to CIHR for a funding opportunity, you have to answer two key questions. Are you integrating sex and are you integrating gender in your health research? And this is important because every cell is sexed and every person is gendered. And our health outcomes are very different depending on whether we are men, women, boys and girls. So we're very, very pleased to be here at the summit talking about issues of women in science, um, but also talking about the integration of sex and gender in health research. I want to um, introduce this afternoon's speaker by providing just a little bit of Canadian context. Uh, our speaker, Julie Payette, received her Bachelor's of Engineering cum laude in 1984 from McGill University. Five years later, in 1989, on December 6th, a gunman walked in to an engineering class at the Ecole Polytechnique and separated the men and women. He went on to murder 14 women and injured 10 women and four men. I mention this because I think it really underlines the importance of thinking about gender considerations and the role of women in STEM research. In Canada, December 6th is commemorated as a national day of remembrance and action on violence against women. Julie Payette has gone on to become a beacon for all of us. She symbolizes what can be accomplished by a determined woman. In a time that was very dark for us, she went on to develop a stellar career, and I'm just going to highlight a few of those points. Uh, sh uh, she is, as I said, an electrical engineer by trade. She's flown two missions in space for the construction of the International Space Station, and during her astronaut training, she completed training as a military pilot on the CT-114 Snowbird jet. She also holds a commercial pilot's license. If that's not, not enough, Ms. Payetta joined NASA Astronaut Corps in Houston in 1996, and she's logged 611 hours and more than 400 orbits around the Earth in two separate space flights on board Space Shuttle's Discovery and Endeavor. I could go on and on, but I also want to just mention some of her recognitions in Canada. She's a knight, it's very interesting, of the National Order of Quebec and an officer of the Order of Canada. These are the highest awards that we give to Canadian citizens. And I think that you'll find um, that you'll agree with what a colleague of mine recently told me. She said that Julie Payette is the best speaker that she has ever heard. <laughs> Sorry about that, but. We've got big expectations now. So please join me in welcoming our speaker for lunch, Julie Payette. You're putting the bar really high. Uh, yeah, exactly. Please. Mesdames et messieurs, bonjour. Hello, everybody. I wonder if uh, I am putting my presentation, uh, do I get uh, to play uh, technician or 
that was not briefed, so I guess I will. Okay, sorry, I'm getting old. It's a good thing I'm a computer engineer. Commence. We start again. Houston, we have a problem. I'd like to speak to you today about some times on how we look at gender and particularly gender in the science, t technology, engineering, and math fields. Why is it that we have sometimes some preconceived views? Just because, yes, in microgravity, things do float. Everything floats, by the way. There's no discrimination. One thing is sure is that if you take the story of mankind trying to conquer one of its last frontier, space, it is amazing how quick we've come from not even being able to fly to being able to contemplate our beautiful planet from above. And if you permit me, I'd like to take you on a whirlwind journey of the role of women in the exploration of space because in the span of less than four decades, we've really come a big part of this particular program and it's a good way to perhaps illustrate what else we can do. I am Julie Payet. I'm from Canada. I was absolutely blessed and privileged to fly two missions on board the Space Shuttle. My first mission was on board Space Shuttle Discovery in 1999. My second one with six lovely, tall, strong men from the United States uh, on board Space Shuttle Endeavour. Uh, I will not bore you with my particular career, but on my second mission, we were seven on board the Space Shuttle Endeavour. And when we took off, we joined up with the International Space Station. On board the International Space Station, there were six people. So the seven of us in the shuttle and the six people in the space station, seven plus six, 13 people. We all joined up for a 16-day mission up in space. And as you can see, there was me and the boys. Lo and behold, when you go on a space mission, especially a construction mission of the International Space Station, every single moment of that day is accounted for, planned for by the people on the ground, because uh, there's no time wasted uh, in there. So the ground folks will assign the different astronauts to different tasks, depending on their specialty, but we also have very many secondary a specialty. So yes, we're a robotics operator and we do spacewalks and we construct things and we repair things, but we're also the cooks, the videographer, the uh, geographer, the, uh, uh, the documenter, and uh, the cleaners. Uh, so every day on, a, on board a spaceship, because it's an enclosed airtight vehicle, somebody has to clean up, particularly the filter of the main intake for the cabin fan, where the air is then refurbished for us to breathe again. That requires a vacuum cleaner to go and clean that, and every day on somebody's timeline, one of the astronauts, there will be filter cleaning, which requires taking out the vacuum cleaner and, again, taking out the dust from the cabin fan filter. Well, I am so proud to say that in my 16 days in space with 12 men, I have never, ever touched the vacuum cleaner. <laughs> now, now, it was not my decision. So why? Why do you think, you know, why, why on earth would a Canadian girl want to go to space? Where did that come from? Well, it came from that time. So many of you remember 1969 to 1972, the Apollo mission. People went to the moon, and we could watch that on TV. What an incredible feat. What an incredible adventure. And perhaps in America, 
We understand the impact of those missions, the immense influence that it had on young people, but it had that influence all over the world. I'm a pure product, like so many of my colleague astronauts, of the Apollo missions. Because just like them, sitting down on the floor of the gymnasium in my primary school, I was watching people go to the moon, and I wanted to do the same. I wanted to put on the spacesuit and walk to the mighty rocket, take off, and then particularly drive that Jeep lunar rover. <laughs> I drive a Wrangler today, but that's about as close as I got to that. The thing is, is that at that time, we're talking 19, early 70s, I'm nine years old, I'm a girl, there's no such thing that go to the moon. I'm uh, not American, they're all American, they're all military, they're all folks that flew airplanes, nobody in my family has ever been in an airplane, period. And then they speak that really language I don't understand at all. So why? And that's inspiration. It's the fact that we all have passions, we all have dreams, we all have interests, and it springs somewhere. And it is in every single one of us. You can never tell what is the spark inside a particular kid and what will make them tick and how they're gonna to contribute to society. Clearly, uh, if I go back in time, uh, the first steps of uh, human space exploration actually started with animals. We weren't sure if people were going to be able to function in microgravity, in weightlessness, if they would be able to think enough blood in the cerebral cortex, if they would be able to swallow or eat or anything. So we send cats and dogs, and then the closest thing that we felt, certainly on the United States part of things, was uh, to human beings and to be able to test uh, our very fledgling space vehicle. And then very close to the chimpanzee, then we send the next best thing, <laughs> the Mercury astronauts. You remember? from that time how extraordinarily great, well, they were. They were the pioneers. They were opening this uncharted territory, pushing the frontier of the known world further than it had ever been before. And already, it was inspiring careers all over the world. But it also inspired a race between two major nations that were at odds with each other, the then Soviet Union and the American the United States of America. And because that race involved being the first, doing the first thing all the time, and it was the first person that would put a satellite in space, Soviet Union, 1957, Sputnik. The first one to put a person in space, Soviet Union, 1961, Yuri Gagarin. First nation to put a woman person in space, 1963, Valentina Tereshkova. Soviet Union. Uh, but once they did that, it would take more than 24 years before another woman would fly in space because they had achieved that. You know, they put the dog, they put the chimpanzee. No, no I'm kidding. <laughs> and then it continued on and on till it culminated until the 20th of June, 1969, where the first nation to put a person on the moon the United States of America, Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin. Weren't we riveted? I sure remember this. And then came the advent of the first, and to this date, only reusable spacecraft ever built and ever operated, the mighty space shuttle. In 1991, when uh, NASA started flying the space shuttle, the first one being uh, Space Shuttle Columbia, it also hired the first group of female astronauts. NASA hired the first female astronaut, the first six, in 1978. And the first one of them, who unfortunately passed away uh, recently, Sally Ride, flew in 1981 on board the second ever space shuttle to fly. And then the era was opening. The world was barely following up, but diversity was definitely reaching, and the pioneer at the forefront of that diversification was the U.S. space program. Ah, but there were other firsts to be done. And whoop, nations were still vying, vying for the 
supremacy. So on one side, they overheard that NASA was preparing the first EVA, extravehicular activity, spacewalk of a woman. So very quickly, they found a convincing one, Svetlana Savetskaya, and she flew red on a, uh, on a Soyuz rocket and performed an EVA in 1984, three months ahead of Kathy Sullivan, who was already slotted to be the first woman to perform a spacewalk uh, on the United States side. If many of you might know her, but my colleague Kathy is currently the head of NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Agency here in the US. Ah, but meanwhile, in a small country up north, you know, where all that Arctic air comes from down to Washington, <laughs> the Canadians decided that they too would like to have a space program and in 1984 hired six astronauts to be payload specialists on board the space shuttle. Among them was a woman, Roberta Bondar, and, uh, and, and five mighty colleagues. Jumping ahead, unfortunately, then we had the first catastrophe in January 1986. We lost Space Shuttle Challenger with on board of crew of seven. This was a bit of a wake-up call, a wake-up call that we are riding machineries, that we are in an operational world, that however careful we are at mitigating risk, that risk remains, but that's true in life as well. Roberta Bondar flew in space, the Canadian, the first Canadian woman in January 1992, and at that time, the space agency is putting an ad in the papers, in the career section of the Canadian paper saying, uh, we're recruiting astronauts. And here I see that, and I'm thinking, wow, I've always wanted to do that. I have a good job, I'm doing well, I will never be selected, but I have to apply, because it has been my dream, my childhood dream. And uh, the only thing I can tell you about that is that I really, really was convinced I could not make it in. Uh, but what lesson I got out of it since they selected me is that if there's few certainties in life, Nothing is sure, ever, exactly. But one thing is certain, is if you don't apply at something you really want, there's a 100% chance of not getting in. So I got in. A little different, the youngest, the only French speaker, the only girl, the only one without a mustache. No, that's not true. <laughs> a little oddity in a very homogeneous, conservative, ultra-performing world. But I had a shot. The foot was in the door. So they trained me. First four years in Canada, and then I joined the NASA Astronaut Corps in 1996 uh, at the Houston Space Center, the mecca of astronaut training. Uh, first, I, I, they sent me to the military jet training. I was not military, but wow, that was my second choice. If I was not going to go to space, I was going to fly jet airplanes. But just to tell you a little anecdote on this, when I, just before I reported to the military base where they train military pilots in Canada, Moose Jaw, Saskatchewan, I thought, well, you know, I really need to fit in. I'm sure none of you in this room has ever felt that, where you are trying to break open a door and you're like, okay, how am I gonna fit in? You know, if only sometimes we stopped worrying about this, but we do. It's part of nature, I think. So before I reported to the training base, I thought, how am I gonna fit in? And I thought, well, what if I cut my hair short? Yeah, so then, you know, that they'll see I'm serious. And, and so I did. I had my hair cut short and I woke up in the middle of the night screaming, because I'd always had hair kind of hanging there like a mop, and I missed it. So I show up at, at the base and as I'm I've been there maybe two weeks, and as I'm taxiing the jet on the tarmac, and you know, the guy is telling me how to park, stop. So the cockpit opens up, take off my helmet, and this guy, the technician, who would have never dared saying that to a real officer, but I'm not a real officer, I'm just a hybrid astronaut to be, said, oh, having a bad hair day, ma'am? <laughs> yeah, the helmet really didn't help. <laughs> And that taught me another lesson. 
that in order to succeed in whatever world you are in, you shouldn't ever compromise who you are intrinsically. And that's exactly what I had done. I had decided to be somebody I was not because thinking that that would actually give me an edge. It didn't give me an edge at all. That is not what gives you an edge. It's your competence. It's your heart. It's your dedication. It's your effort. And it is your stubbornness, not your hair. <laughs> so wear it the way you want. Fast forwarding, we're continuing. I'm training to become an astronaut. I haven't flown my first flight yet, but we're doing something miraculous because the Cold War has ended and the former enemies who were racing against each other are now partners. This is an amazing picture taken by astronaut on board a little Soyuz capsule of the space shuttle hooked up to the Mir Russian space station. We're talking here 1990. Unbelievable that the two are working together in a place, oh, by the way, where there is just no room for error, where failure is not an option, where collaboration, thank Lord, is the only way to survive. Very many uh, astronauts went on board Mir, but very few women because the Russian space program has had very few women, three in its history so far. The first one, the first one to do an EVA, remember, Svetlana, and another one, which I'm, I didn't portray here, who was the first one to do a long duration mission on board the Mir space station. And the one that had the record for the United States was my roommate at NASA, Shannon Lucid, who stayed for uh, six months in a Russian station with two Russian cosmonauts speaking Russian and doing the right things. I finally get my chance to join the team at NASA. I'm gonna go a little quicker. There, this is really cool. If that's what you've wanted to do and you're a geek like me, to learn how to fly a space vehicle, because that's what we are, spacecraft operators, how to train your reflex and your, and your judgment and your decision-making abilities in fast-moving airplanes, and then, yes, to learn how to perform all the tasks and playing with all the toys that all of us so enjoy. And then you get your first take. I was surrounded by, by greatness. And I was surrounded by such amazing model. Just shortly before my first flight, Commander Eileen Collins, first woman to ever command a space shuttle, just flew. There's only been two. And Pam Melroy, uh, the second Commander of Space Shuttle is right here in Washington, D.C. She works at, uh, at the FAA. Here's uh, Eileen Collins dancing with a French astronaut. Who else would do that? <laughs> Inside a tunnel in weightlessness. So there goes the first flight. Have the chance to ride the mighty rocket all the way to space, 220 miles above the surface of the Earth. A fantastic experience to go there, the International Space Station to be part of a construction crew. Today, this is what the International Space Station looks like. It has people on board all the time. It's been inhabited since November 2001, 12 and a bit years nonstop with people on board. And why is it we rarely hear about it in a newspaper? It's because even though it's operated 365 days a year, People don't kill each other on board. They're getting along, many nations, speaking different languages, and things are working. Another, perhaps, lesson. On board the International Space Station, we have rotating crew every six months. Men, women, Russian, Japanese, Canadian, Europeans, Americans, everybody working together. And there is no discrimination. If you are good, if you can demonstrate that you can do the job, which is the one and only criteria, then you can be a member of the International Space Station. Just in passing, I have to show that, unfortunately, in 2003, we lost our second space shuttle out of the five that existed at the time, and we lost Space Shuttle Columbia uh, with a full crew on board. But continuing on the fact that on board the International Space Station, you can do all the tasks. You have to demonstrate your competence, your will, your dedication. 
And Peggy Whitson became the first female commander of, an, of the International Space Station, and she actually did that tour twice, and later became, for the first time ever, the chief of the NASA astronaut office in Houston, Texas. Little known, but she was not only the first woman, but the first civilian to ever hold that post. And now at NASA, it is very common for us, it was normal to have everybody that was competent that could deliver and I was willing to be in the direction, to be in charge, to be deciding. Like we have so many of our gods, flight, flight directors, uh, if you remember the Apollo 13 movie uh, and Gene Kranz who's directing uh, Mission Control, well these people really exist and they are really God and they really decide everything, but we have now a cadre and they are handpicked from the controllers in the room for training to become a flight director and anybody can apply. In space, on my first flight, we were three women and we actually took a suffragette flag, an original uh, in space because we were commemorating a hundred years of uh, fight to become a person and to have the right to vote. But the person on the uh, far, I guess left, <laughs> Ellen Ochoa is currently the director, meaning the head on show, the big banana of the NASA Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas. And as we speak, number two at NASA is Lori Garver. I have been so impressed during my time here in this ability to overlook the curly hair, the mustache, the skin color, in lieu of development possibility, in lieu of being able to contribute to the team, in lieu of, yes, they can do the job, so we'll give them that opportunity, we'll nurture them, we'll grow them, and if they need help, we'll bring them, because we don't want the bar here, we want the bar here, and we'll nurture those folks. This is something that is intrinsic to the society, perhaps not perfectly, and certainly not in all milieu and in all levels, but in aerospace, I saw something that is indeed a model that we can look forward. Today, it is very normal. The head Lockheed Martin is a woman. She's only one of many. In Canada, we're a little behind, I must say, on, on the aerospace side, uh, but we're also making our way forward. Those models are starting to be more numerous and that is a good thing. There is no reason why we are still so much in shortage, however, in our STEM schools and in some in our STEM fields. Because you can be just the way you are and have a ton of fun in those fields. This has been a perennial problem now for decades. When people say, ah, well, why is it that we only are stagnating with 20% enrollment in engineering faculties, 40% enrollment of women, why is it? Well, if it was a simple problem, clearly we would have solved it a long time ago. It is not a simple problem. It's a multifaceted problem, and it's a problem that touches us all. It is not a problem of women, and it's not a problem of men. It's a society problem. We want people in every sphere, cultural, technological, medical. We don't want any field that deprives itself of almost 50% of its potential just because it's hard to get in or it's not thought out at the place where we should be. When I look at the problem of why is it that we're still stagnating after 20 years of initiatives, of trying to have more representation, diverse representation in the technological field of women. I, I, that's what I come up with. They're hard to get, not because they're not good. You all know, often girls outperform boys at high school in math and physics. So that's, and it's not because they're not interested. I run a science center in Montreal. No gender discrimination, they're just out there having a, a ton of fun, why is it that they don't go? And then once they go in, why is it that they don't stay in as high a number? My little thought is maybe because it takes such stubbornness to stay at first. Because the 
obstacles sometimes look a little too much and then maybe perhaps it's a little easier somewhere else, but people don't stay. Why is it also that we still have issues having equal opportunities within climbing the ladder? Why it is so important to demonstrate that yes, I have curly hair, but I can fly an airplane, yes. It, those still play. And then, guess what? There is to have accommodation for the fact that there are imperatives out there that we can't just change just yet. And all this together combined with perhaps one of the hardest part, the, that's the accommodation part, is the image that surrounds it all. Do I, can I identify myself as an auto mechanics? Do I identify myself as a nurse? Do I identify myself as a teacher? We are still categorizing ourselves to some extent, and we're all guilty of that. And to some extent, that is not helping recruiting into the fields of math and science. In Canada, surprisingly, lately, we've had an explosion of female politicians who've been elected to high office. Out of the 10 provinces and two territories in Canada, we have five of our premiers, premier ministre, that are women. The models are starting to emerge very strongly, can be leader, leader of states. I am sure that this is going to happen to the United States very soon. <laughs> but is the image sufficient? I'll close by really going back on those four items. It is a societal problem that should touch us all. On the recruitment aspect, we do understand that it starts right at home. It starts right with the entourage. It starts right whenever there is someone that will say to a young girl age 14 and says, I would like to be a physicist and I would like to study quantum physics and then someone somewhere, it could be a girlfriend, it could be a mother, it could be an aunt. It's not gender related, it says quantum physics? Oh. Or somebody says, yes, I'd like to be a mining engineer or a geologist. Really? It starts with this empowerment and fortunately, I know I, that's what I received when I told my mom I'd like to be an astronaut. She didn't flinch. She just said, okay, well, you better go to school and work hard. I would have said I wanted to be a cook. She would have said the exact same thing. <laughs> because that's exactly what it is. On the retention aspect, clearly there are actions to be done. We understand that when young women go into master's degree and PhDs, and let alone if they make it to the postdoc, they're really, really good. They're excellent, but they have doubts. And the more they progress through those ladders, the more those doubts. We know that. The studies, we have done so many in the last 20 years. We can do concrete action to make sure we, we land a hand that we make sure that we, they stay at the times of doubt. But we don't do that because we are so homogeneous in our approach. In order for us to succeed with numbers, then we need to pick and try to retain every single one we can along the way. On the way of promotion, some people here in this room probably remember my time at uh, the Natural Science and Engineering Research Council. I am not very in favor of special program to come in through the side door. The reason being that I don't think it serves anybody's purpose to be brought into the side door saying, well, they're not competent enough, but we will bring them in and then uh, that's a view. I still hold that view. I, however, really strongly believe that we can do to some extent, some affirmative appointment through deliberate action, meaning, hey, Let's see who are good out there and then bring them in and then with active networking, which I'm sorry for the women in the room, we don't do enough. If you are a member of a board and there is a position that comes up, then you start looking in your network and that network includes everybody. But this is something we, that sometimes we don't think of. 
These are concrete action. If we start doing that, the ball then gets rolling. And in some milieu, it already has. In terms of accommodation, progressive targeted legislation, not to impose on people what to do or quota, but to make things easier for everybody to flourish. Uh, I'll give the example of the province of Quebec, where I live now. We have parental leave for women up to one year after giving birth. You can choose to stay only two weeks at home. You can choose to stay with 90% of your salary for a year at home. We have subsidized daycare, $7 a day. I don't want to ask you what is the current rate in Washington. <laughs> well, it's really hard to do everything if you don't have proper care, correct? And that's true for everybody. It's true for the family unit, not just for the mother. We have legislation which definitely pushes on gender equity and employment. There is more and more aspects of flex work. Flex work might be a way to ensure that accommodation. And yes, indeed, uh, I don't see joy anymore. Zero, zero, zero tolerance in uh, legislation for any abuse or any violence. But last but not least, look at the stereotypes out there. I am dreaming of the day when big movies and big television series will have as their protagonists not only lawyers and politicians and emergency doctors, but crystallographers and zoologists and veterinarian and electrical engineers. Because that is part of the fabric of society to start bringing down the image, the identity, which we know stops young girls from choosing STEM and staying in STEM. But last but not least, and I will leave you with that, it is always for a society to progress, for a society to move further, for a society to discover new worlds. It's true knowledge, knowledge and knowledge. The more our societies and everyone in it has access to education, I guess the more modern we'll become. So no, we do not have a bad hair day. Things are looking great. We're all in charge. Thank you so much. <laughs> I think you'll agree with me that my friend was correct. She is a fabulous speaker. <laughs> Truly inspirational and so many lessons for us in terms of dreaming the dream, collaborating, um, working hard, and more importantly, not worrying about our hair. So uh, thank you so much for being with us. Um, I think you'll, those messages will just continue to, um, to be thinking about over the course of the next uh, few days. Uh, it's truly an inspiration to have you with us. Thank you very, very much.